I'm Cindy Briggs, and this is Soldier's Heart. Over the past few episodes, I've told you a lot about my grandfather, John Briggs, who served in the Army during World War II. He was an amazing man, but he wasn't alone in this journey of life. He wasn't the only one who sacrificed during that war. So now it's time for you to get to know his other half, my grandmother, Daisy, my nana. She was diminutive in stature, but not in substance. This woman ran things. Our family, her church, the organizations she volunteered with. She was as Southern as they come, but beneath that veneer, she put up with exactly zero nonsense. She did not trifle. She also didn't get into a lot of the hobbies of women of her generation. She hated sewing or crafts of any sort. She wasn't much of a reader. She loved playing rook and made a mean pound cake. Mostly, though, she made stuff happen. Fundraising at her church, volunteering at the hospital, delivering meals on wheels. She was constantly in motion until her heart began to fail her at age 99. Six weeks later, she died in the fall of 2013. She missed her 100th birthday by six months. It was the one goal she failed to reach. Granddaddy was 31 when he was drafted. Nana was 29. My dad was one year old. I often think about how she felt saying goodbye to her husband for two and a half years, wondering if he was warm and dry or safe or alive, whether or not he'd get to meet his son. She never talked much about those years. She wasn't one to dwell on the unpleasant parts of her past, But her strength and independence are obviously implied. She got through it, somehow. Which brings me to the subject of this week's podcast. Susan Rudd is a few years younger than my Nana, but cut from the same durable cloth. She turned 100 last year and continues to be a vital presence in our community. Every month or two, she writes a letter to the editor of our newspaper. And I always delight in seeing her name and wish everyone reading knew who she was. It makes me want to stand on my front porch and shout, y'all, she's a hundred. She was in the army in World War II. So without further ado, allow me to introduce you to my friend, Susan. (laughs) So Susan, just for the record, Uh um, can you state um, what branch of service you were in and, um, and when you served? I was in the army because the army was the only one that promised to keep my girlfriend and I together. But when we joined, it was not really the Army, it was the uh, Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And it wasn't uh, into the Army until that July of that year, which was 43, 1943. What prompted you to join in the first place? What, What made you want to join up? Well, it was getting pretty boring at home without any boys. <laughs> and uh, the boy I was engaged to was had been in the Marines since 42, uh, January of 42, so he got in just as quick as he could. Everybody we knew was in service. Mm-hmm. Every, and uh, the sad part of the whole thing was it seemed like the, the greatest boys The ones with the most potential and everything were the first ones that signed up and they were the first ones killed. I don't think one of those boys that I ever really admired from high school, not one of them came back. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. We just got tired of waiting around. We just said, Roselle was my girlfriend, and she 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 was a nice 
a great girl. Um, and uh, we just decided, hey, maybe if we get in, we can get this over with and <laughs> get the boys back home. As Susan described her motivations for enlisting, I put myself right in her shoes. She was a young woman, unmarried, done with high school, but not quite sure of what she wanted to do next. And all the boys in town were gone. Then this opportunity presents itself, a chance for an adventure, and she took it. And neither one of our mothers wanted us to go. And we kept talking about it. And finally, we decided, uh, because they were recruiting them down in Columbus, which was the capital of Ohio, of course. And um, we had the opportunity to go down. So her mother thought I was, she was at my house, and my mother thought I was at her house. And we were gone for the whole weekend, and they never had a clue. (laughs) Let's pause here to talk about another inspiring woman of the era, one whose life was indelibly linked to Susan's, even though they never met. Edith Norse Rogers was the first woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Massachusetts. Without Edith, Susan's story couldn't have happened. Edith Norse Rogers introduced the bill that established the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in May of 1941, a good seven months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The WAAC was established, and I quote, for the purpose of making available to the national defense the knowledge, skill, and special training of women of the nation. Congress approved the bill in May 1942, and 35,000 women from around the country signed up for the first 1,000 positions. In the WAAC, women received the same basic pay as men, but that's where the equity stopped. Women could not receive overseas pay, were not given federal health insurance, nor could their families collect a death benefit if they died in service. With civilian jobs taking off, women's interest in the WAAC began to fall. To reignite interest, FDR signed legislation on July 1, 1943, which changed the name of the Corps to the Women's Army Corps, nicknamed WAC. This gave women all the rank, privileges, and benefits of their male counterparts. One final note about Edith Norse Rogers. In her 35 years in the House of Representatives, she was a lion on behalf of veterans. In addition to helping establish the WACs, she sponsored the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, also known as the GI Bill. It changed the lives of servicemen and women after World War II through educational and financial benefits that helped cement the U.S. economic dominance in the second half of the 20th century. So, in short, she was a badass. And I think I never heard of her until I began researching Susan's story. So, let's get back to Susan and her best friend, Roselle. They're in Columbus, Ohio. They're raring to sign up for the Army. And that's when they hit their first obstacle. I almost didn't make it because I was nearsighted. And I didn't pass the eye exam, and I was sitting out in the hall crying because <laughs> I wanted to make it so bad. And there, Roselle had got through, and and I wasn't going to be able to be with her. And uh, one of the sergeants uh, came back out, and he got me, and he said, "We're going to let you take the eye exam again." And I went in there, and still couldn't see that chart. And he says, mm, mm. I said, M? He said, okay, you passed. That's amazing. It's amazing. So yeah. then he wanted to, me to meet him for cocktails. And I didn't want to do that. So um, I met him, and we went to this place. I didn't drink. And uh, he ordered the cocktail, and I spilled it on myself. Um, I said, I didn't spill it on him. And so I said, oh, it's all I got to wear, and I'm I'm soaked. I was soaked. (laughs) 
so I had to go back to the, where we were staying at the hotel. So that I got out of that because I had a feeling that it was going to progress and I wasn't interested. You were very clever. I love that. So after all of that, we got in, we were sworn in, and then we went home and they said they would send us our orders later. So uh, How did your mom react when you got home? And well, they were both upset, really, really upset. So mother made me promise that I wouldn't volunteer to go overseas if the opportunity arose. Well, I was thinking, you know, you don't volunteer for this stuff. When you're in the Army, they send you. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I, I promise I won't volunteer. Susan was in the Army now, and it was about to get interesting. In addition to all the adjustments any new soldier might experience in the Army, Susan, Roselle, and their friends were confronted with a unique twist. The Army simply didn't know what to do with the tidal wave of women enlistees. Their presence was unprecedented. <laughs> what do you remember about basic training? What was it like? Did you have to do all the same things that the men had to do? or how was uh, that To a degree, we did. Actually, it was um, pretty hard for them to decide just exactly what to do with us because they hadn't had any experience with women before. So um, we really got away with murder if we pressed it. But uh, we did, we had to fall out early in 4.30, sometimes in the morning, uh, and do calisthenics and, and uh, um, report for duty. And he, they called the roll and they, to know that everybody was there where we were supposed to be. And after the, the uh, calisthenics, we went uh, to our meal and we for breakfast and we went as a group we didn't ever go by ourselves and at that time they gave us the opportunity to leave with honors uh, and go home if we did not want to stay or we would be uh, into the army until the duration of the war we could not get out before then unless we were discharged for something <laughs> not good. <laughs> and so uh, I think out of a hundred and we had about 178 in our battalion and I don't think any more than four went home. Wow. The rest stayed. And I really think it was probably for the same reason that I did, because uh, I still wanted to be there and still wanted to do something. But I had gone through basic training, and I thought, the heck with this. I'm not, I'm not going to go through all that and have it just wasted. So, And I think that was what most of the girls did, too. After going through basic, and we got out of that, but no, we're going to stay. Susan and Roselle had survived basic training. However, their paths were about to diverge. Remember back to the night Susan and Roselle returned home to Cleveland after they enlisted? Susan promised her mother she'd not volunteer to go overseas. That promise became her one lasting regret. Roselle ended up in England and, and in Paris, France. And I ended up in California, and I could not get out of California because mm -hmm. I would have to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so I stuck to my promise, but I was sorry I'd made it. <laughs> they, after basic training, then they sent us to school. They picked her out right away to be a recruiter. She, she, was, she was a very attractive woman. She. Uh, I spoke extremely well. Uh, she had a very nice presentation. Uh, for some reason, they sent her over to uh, England, and then they sent her to Paris um, before they really had all of the Nazis cleared out of there. So they had snipers that they had to be watching, and it was cold. They didn't have any heat, and she said they went to bed with their overcoats on, their shoes and socks on. They even had to wrap their heads up 
she was so cold. So while Roselle shivered in fabulous Paris, Susan was sent by train to dusty, hot California. And we were put on a train that was hooked on to a troop um, contingent of men being shipped out. And we were segregated from the men, uh, actually. There was no way that there could be any mix between the, the boys and us. And when we got to Texas, um, one of the men was dead in one of the troop cars, and they didn't know whether he had been murdered or whether he had killed himself. Oh, we were there for 24 hours, and we didn't have water. We were all dry and hot. And they finally released us, and uh, we never did hear whether the man had committed suicide or whether he had and we just got started uh, through Texas, and uh, <clears throat> we went on to a siding because there was a train coming the other way, and as the trains passed us, our engine blew up and killed a man on the other train. Oh my gosh. So we were there for 24 hours. So I said, well, let's go look at the town. We get out there and we're walking around looking at everything and the MPs come by in a jeep and they said, what are you doing out here? And I said, what do you mean, what are we doing? We're walking. <laughs> and he says, El Paso is out of bounds for her women. You can't, you're not allowed to be on the streets here. What? Yeah. He pulled all of us into his Jeep, and we had to go back to the station and just stay in the station. And uh, I don't know why it was out of bounds to women, but evidently they had some problems down there. We got put on a black troop train that these people had been out in the desert for five days with no water, showers, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was full. And there wasn't even seats for us, but they put us on it anyway. I finally sat down on top of the bags, and I fell asleep, and I kept falling off the bags. And what woke me up was one of the men picking me up and putting me back on the bag. It took us five and a half days to cross the United States mm -hmm. in the train. She arrived at Lemoore Army Airfield in Central California, just south of Fresno. From the air, it looked like a giant patch of dirt, crisscrossed by roads and runways. There were barracks to house the 4,000 soldiers and airmen stationed there, a mess hall, airplane hangars, and shops. Later, a swimming pool and amphitheater were added. It was not a place designed for style or comfort. Susan's first impressions of the base were grim and hallmarked by heat and dust, her military training continued in the hot desert sun. This is where we were. We were on bivouac one time, and we had to go along the um, the road, and they strafed us. And we had to run. And when the airplanes came over us, we had to run off that road and hide in the ditches out in this desert. <sighs> were they were they actually shooting at you? Or was it? Well, they were assimilating it, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. good. That scared me a little. Yeah. But, <laughs> what was going on? Well, yeah, but that we was... had to run and jump and, and uh, dive down in the ditches, regardless of the fact that it was just to uh, make believe. As far as her role on base, Susan quickly fell into a series of fortunate placements that allowed her to leave her mark. Though she trained to be a clerk, there wasn't an open clerk position at Lemoore. It turned out okay because... I wasn't too interested in being company clerk anyway. <laughs> so then I got all sorts of jobs. Uh, but they had to keep me busy with doing something, but they didn't have a place for me. People, uh, somebody had given four or $500, and that was a lot of money in those days, um, for us to have a garden oh. in, in, in our area. So they sent me, 
I was in charge of the gardens. So I planned out the gardens and they sent me off in a staff car and to a nursery and I picked out all, and I didn't know what grew in California. Mm -hmm. And I picked out all that stuff and in the end we just uh, had a garden. Mm -hmm. And we had a rose, rose garden in one area and we put some trees in and with some bushes and stuff. And, and they still didn't have a job for me, so they uh, had me decorate their uh, our NCO club uh, living room for our area, so we could entertain our friends in there, which means boys. Mm -hmm. And um, so I I decorated that. We can, and that was fun. I bet. Yeah, there was a contest to. Um, uh, redecorate or to redesign the men's barracks to a women's barracks and my design was the cheapest and the best and so for some reason I was really good at that I was really good at designing stuff by summer of 1945 the war was winding down Susan was transferred to Phoenix Arizona to complete her tour there she became a trainer for pilots on what was called the link simulator Pilots in World War II used some instruments to fly, but much of the flying was done by sight. The Link Simulator was the first training mechanism that taught pilots to fly primarily by instruments. The inventor had the foresight to realize that all these trained pilots might want to work in the growing commercial airlines after the war, and instrument training was critical. So as pilots met their flight quota in the South Pacific, they were sent to Phoenix, where they met Susan, for training. Well, they had... Tremendous eagles. <laughs> well, you have to be. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you've lived through all that for that many trips, mm -hmm. you're really special. Mm -hmm. You aren't really are. And they just felt like they were being. <laughs> it was just insulting to have to come in here and and learn how to do this when they had done it without and lived. And and then of course we all had to know how to do do it too. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know if I could really work that uh, link trainer. So I got in there and um, found my airport right away with my um, from the radio. And I made the most perfect um, record that I have. I, I actually if you had seen it in a book as an illustration, you would have thought that's what it was. Yeah, it was just perfect. Nice. <laughs> I was so proud of that because they looked at it and they just turned around and walked off. <laughs> she can do it. On September second, nineteen forty-five, the Japanese surrendered and the war was over. Susan remained in Phoenix for a while until it was time for her own official discharge. So after Phoenix, were you discharged after that? Was yeah, that and I was sent back to Lemoore, mm -hmm. and we were there until December. And then uh, they sent they sent us to the nearest place to your home that was a military base. And that was Fort Sheridan in Chicago, and I lived in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And... Um, and we had uh, we where we were in that this camp we had German prisoners we had coal for uh, stoves in the barracks to heat it and we were at that place for I think I was there about a week or more before I was formally discharged and the 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 prisoners German prisoners were. Uh, working there and they were trying to get <laughs> they were trying to get a girl yeah. somebody to to they could marry to so they could stay they didn't want to go back home uh, I kind of felt sorry for them I thought gee you know if I was a prisoner here I think I would try to escape while I was here mm -hmm. and see but and they, yeah they were trying to learn English they were trying everything to just uh, I, they wanted to stay. They didn't want to go back. Mm -hmm. Susan left Chicago and the German POWs behind, 
came home to Cleveland and married her Marine Corps fiancé. They settled down and started a family. Susan's life would continue to unfold in unexpected ways, including a divorce that left her a single parent, compelling her to find her own career and to become self-sufficient. She also volunteered in her community and at her church. In her late 60s, she took up painting. She had her first solo art show three years ago at age 97. She is, in every way, a hero. After our interview, Susan made me a simple supper of soup and salad. We got to talking about the concerns of the day, about the fractious politics that divide us. I told her that I worry sometimes about how I'll handle it if things get really bad. In her calm voice, she said, Well, then you'll find strengths you didn't know you had. You'll figure it out when the time comes. And she's exactly right. I owe so much to women like Susan, like my Nana, to all the women who defied expectations and stereotypes to go their own way. They paved the way for me so I could get an education, have a rewarding career, travel independently, unafraid. I have a life that I love because of their wily courage and tenacity. Susan became the woman that she is in part because of her time in the Army, which exposed her to a bigger world, a more complicated but more interesting one. I'll tell you, it it, uh, really expanded my uh, awareness of other people. Mm because we were living with people that were strangers, almost. And, and you had to get along. Mm-hmm. So you, you did, and uh, I, I have to say, I was a pretty much of a prude to begin with. And um, I, I'm afraid I look down on people sometimes. I didn't think they quite were the... And not that I was so wonderful either, because I I never was anything in particular. But um, it it really got me to realize that, and no bad matter how bad you were, you have some part of you is good. And and um, and so I it really broadened my <laughs> scope uh, of. Um, being with people and I am so really uh, glad of that because if you don't appreciate anybody else from there you, you don't live you, you, you'll never experience knowing people if, if you don't just accept somebody and, and look for the good mm-hmm. and there's always you can always find some so I, I really thought the Army did a big job, a good job on me. Soldier's Heart is written and produced by me, Cindy Briggs, and features veteran stories from North Carolina. We honor vets by listening to their stories. You can follow along on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Soldiers Heart NC. If you have an idea for a story or interview, email us at soldiersheartnc at gmail.com. Special thanks to the New Winston Museum of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where all of these stories are archived. You can learn more about the museum at newwinston.org. 